Open your Bible, if you would, to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus 3. We don't have near as many scriptures this morning as we did last week. And we'll be spending most of our time in these uh, first couple chapters of, of Exodus, especially chapter 3. Wonderful to see all of you this morning. Glad that you're here. Thankful we can be together. I'm not going to ask you for a show of hands for this. If you'd like to raise your hand, you're welcome to. Uh, but when, when you were born, your parents gave you your first gift. They gave you your name. And when you have children of your own, or if you have already had children of your own, you gave them a gift. You gave them their name. And names have significance, don't they? Uh, and sometimes we give names to our children or names were given to us because of that significance. I'd be curious to know how many of you have a name that was given to you by your parents because of a family member that you have or uh, some influential friend or person in their lives. I, uh, several of you do. And um, that, that's a common thing. All of our children have at least one name that is a family name, whether it's their first or their middle name, it has family significance. And in the case of our, our youngest daughter, we named her after someone who uh, was not family, but was someone who was a very influential and dear friend of ours. We give names to honor the legacy of special people. Sometimes we give names to emphasize qualities that we hope to see in our children. And so maybe you've met someone whose name is Faith or Hope. I know a girl named Charity. So sometimes parents give names to emphasize qualities that they want to see. You're probably familiar with this, but I want to give you some examples of some other names that have significance. Sometimes a person's surname, their last name, will tell you something about their ancestry. Specifically, it will tell you the occupation of one of their ancestors. Smith is the most common last name in both America and England. And that comes from the occupation of a blacksmith or a white smith, that was a new term to me this week, by the way. A white smith is someone who works in uh, less, well, shall I say more delicate metals, like tin, a tin smith. That's someone called a white smith, as opposed to a blacksmith who's dealing with hard iron and steel. A silver smith, a gold smith, there, there's all kinds of different metal workers, and Smith has come to be a very popular last name. Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. A Wright is a person who is skilled in making things out of wood. So a shipwright built ships. A cartwright, maybe you know someone with that last name, is someone who built carts. A wainwright is someone who made wagons. And a playwright makes, well, okay, those aren't made out of wood, but you can see where they got there, right? Cooper. Where's Sandy? I would ask where Brian is, but I know where he is. Poor man's been sick for a month. A cooper is someone who makes wooden casks or barrels. Weaver, it's a popular last name. That one's obvious. So sometimes a person's last name will tell you about them. In Scripture, names often have great significance. Isaac was named Laughter because Sarah laughed when she heard the promise of God that she would have a son. Jacob means Supplanter, a fitting name because of his interactions with his brother Esau, that began the day that they were born. His name, Jacob, would later be changed to Israel 
because he had striven with God and was successful. Moses, whom we're going to be talking about this morning, had a son named Gershom, which means stranger, because he was born to Moses while Moses was in a strange foreign land, the land of Midian. Scripture teaches us that God has a name. And it isn't God, by the way. God is not his name. God is really a generic term to speak of deity. The Canaanite nations that we studied last week, they had their gods, right, little g? They had their deities. And those deities, those gods, had specific names, Baal. Ashtoreth, Molech, they had specific names that were assigned to those gods. So God is not the name for the deity of Christians and Jews. It's a generic term to refer to deity. But God is called by many names in Scripture. But there is one name that is used far more often than any other. In fact, this name is used over 6,800 times in Scripture. It is a name that is so holy that the Jews for many centuries dared not even to pronounce the name for fear of committing blasphemy. And the name that I'm talking about is one that you have probably seen before, although not in this format. And that is the name... Come on, come on. Ah, there we go. Okay, that's the name. Y-H-W-H. Now, you've probably heard this name before. Yahweh. And when you saw those four consonant letters put up onto the screen, that's immediately what came into your mind. You can see Yahweh. If you just insert the two vowels, you can see it in that name. I want to talk about this name this morning. Where does this come from? What do we do with this name? How should we understand what this name means and what God is saying to us by telling us this about himself? So that takes us to Exodus chapter 3. I want to give you a a word that, uh, before we begin our study, that you may come across if you ever read more about this, if you ever study this, and that is the word tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. That's not a word you're going to use in your everyday language, but that's a Greek word that simply means four letters. You can see that, really, if you look at the word, right? Tetra is Greek for four, and then what do you see in the grammaton? You kind of see the word grammar, When you're in grammar school, what are you learning? You're learning your letters. You're learning your foundational elements. Uh, You're learning the the elementary and the rudimentary kinds of ideas. So tetragrammaton, this is the term that was used to talk about God's name, this four-letter name. Now, where are the vowels? If you say the name Yahweh, you, you see there's an A, there's an E in there. Well, why isn't it here? Well, do you understand that Hebrew doesn't have vowels? At least not in the written form. Hebrew does not have vowels. And so when you are writing it, you only write the consonants and you insert the appropriate vowels as you are coming across it in your reading and in your understanding. And so that's why you see this four consonant name. So let's start in Exodus chapter 3 and let's talk about what's happening here and where this name of God is comes from. God calls Moses in Exodus chapter 3 while he is shepherding his father-in-law Jethro's sheep in the land of Midian. And God comes to him, verse 1 of Exodus 3 tells us, at Mount Horeb. Horeb, the mountain of God. I want you to know that when you see Horeb in the Old Testament, that is the same place as Mount Sinai. So when Moses sees God in the burning bush, 
Moses is at Mount Sinai where that happens. And God speaks to him from this bush. And so in chapter 3 and in verse 4, when Moses uh, comes to the bush to see what, why is this bush burning but it's not being burned up, verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And now God is going to explain and introduce himself, explain who he is. He says in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So now Moses knows who he's talking to. This is not just some magical thing that's happening when he sees this bush that's on fire. Something incredible is happening here, and now he knows who it is that he is talking to. Now if you drop down in verse 10... God says, therefore, come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, Moses is going to begin the train of excuses. I'm not up to this. I'm not the one you want for this. He says in verse 11, who am I that, that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring? This? Well, why are you getting me to do this? I am no one special. Uh, I, I think you need to find someone else. But God assures him in verse 12, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, I want you to notice this. You shall worship God at this mountain. Where did the Israelites go after they leave the land of Egypt? Mount Sinai. They came to this mountain where God appeared to Moses. So Moses has been given his charge. Go back to Egypt. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him that the God of the Hebrews has called them to leave. So Moses asks a question in verse 13. Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Who am I going to say has sent me? And you're familiar with God's response in verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So when God answers this question for Moses, he really gives a description of what he's about to say in verse 15, which we'll come to in a moment. But he says, I am who I am. And then he shortens it and says, now say this to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, I don't know if you knew this about me, but I am not a Hebrew scholar. Just in case you were wondering, I don't speak Hebrew. I don't read it. What little bit I have done, I have found to be extremely difficult and very uncomfortable for me. But I'm going to do it this morning because I'm an expert now. So, no, I'm kidding. I'm only putting some words up here in Hebrew for you to see some nuanced difference. Okay? So in verse 14, when God says, I am who I am, that word, I am, in Hebrew is this word, E-H-Y-E-H. I want you to notice the consonants, H-Y-H. -H. That's really the important thing I want you to see. And this idea, it means I am or I will be. And it comes from the verb, H-Y-H, -H, to be. Okay? That's what God says. I am. I exist. I want you to notice a couple of things about what God says. First of all, notice that this is spoken in the first person. I am. It's not you. It's not he, she, it, they, them, I. 
It's first person. Secondly, notice the present tense of it. I am. It's not I was at one time. I used to be a long time ago. I am. It's present tense. God says that that he is. As I understand it, the scholarship says that these words can also be translated this way. I will be who I will be. What does that tell you? It tells you that there can be a future element to this. I will be. What I am today is what I will be tomorrow. God is entirely self-sustaining. He does not depend upon anyone or anything in order to exist. He is not reliant upon something else. He is not dependent upon anyone else. He simply is. He is a self-sustaining being. Now put that in contrast to men. God is infinite while man is finite. We have a beginning and an end. God does not. God exists in and of himself without dependence upon another. Men are completely dependent upon other things or other people for life. We cannot live without resources like air, food, water, shelter, heat. God can. God doesn't need water, food, a house to live in. We depend upon all of those things, all of which come from the source, which is God. So in simple terms, when Moses says, who will I tell them has sent me? What God says to Moses is, I am, I always have been, I always will be. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I have always existed. Now in verse 15, God gives his name. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord. Does your Bible put the word Lord in all capital letters? I suspect it does. Most newer translations do that. When you see that in your Bible, when you see capital L-O-R-D, the word that you need to see there is the tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. That's the word that's used. Don't confuse it with Capital L, lowercase o-r-d. That's a different word, and that's why translators treat them in that way. All caps, Lord, is this word, y-h-w-h. Now, what does God say about this? Verse 15, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. Notice, This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. This is how I want to be remembered. This is how I want to be known. I want you to notice the similarity between these two words which are spoken. Over here, you remember me telling you that this is the first person. I am. I will be. Over here, it's the same verb that's used, but instead of being in the first person, now it's in the third person. He is. He will be. It's the same word, but it's used in a different tense. Think about it. Wouldn't it be awkward and unnatural for Moses to go to the Israelites and, Moses, who sent you to us? I will be sent me here. Wait a minute. 
That would be a little unusual, right? That'd be very unnatural. But what if Moses came and he said, He will be sent me to you. That would make more sense, wouldn't it? And that's what, that's what happens. This is the third person of the verb. And so this is where this name is given as the memorial name for God, the name by which he will be known, the name that means I always was, I am, I always will be. Past, present, future. That's God's name. I have been, I am now, I always will be. I've learned in recent days that most scholars tell us that this name, YHWH, should be understood as the name that you know as Yahweh. That's what you've heard before. But there are many scholars who have come out and said, we're not exactly sure that that's right. And they offer some very good explanations. And they will say that the way to pronounce this name instead of Yahweh is Yahovah. Does that sound like any other word that you are familiar with? It does, doesn't it? Jehovah, right? Doesn't that, doesn't that sound very similar? Yahovah, Jehovah. Interesting. Now, that's not critically important for us to do anything with. I'm just mentioning that. But before I move away from Exodus chapter 3, I want to call attention to some things about the fact that God has a name. Several things I, I want to mention to you. First, God having a name, as opposed to being this nameless being out there, God having a name makes him personal. He is not a force or a gas that just floats around in space. He's a person. He is a being, and he has a name. We are not dealing with George Lucas and Star Wars here and some mystical force that just ties everything together and if you wave your hands just right, things move. A force like gravity is impersonal. You can't communicate with gravity. You can't draw close to gravity. You can't honor it or worship it. You can experience it if you fall out of a tree. But you can't do much else with an impersonal force. But God is personal. God has spoken and communicated to us. We can speak and communicate to him. You can draw close to him. You can worship him. Because he is a personal God, not an impersonal force. He's personal. A force is amoral, but God is not. Gravity has no moral standards. Gravity does not teach us anything about right and wrong. But God does that. Not only does God teach us about right and wrong, he defines it. He is the objective standard of it. A force like gravity, because it is amoral, it makes no demands of us. Gravity doesn't compel me to keep and adhere to objective standards of morality, but God does. A force doesn't have ethical demands that it holds me accountable to, but God does. God being personal means, finally, that he is aware of and active in the world's events. 
And you see that right here in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 2. Go back to chapter 2. Look with me at verse 23. Exodus 2, 23. It came about in the course of those days, many days, that the king of Egypt died. And the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry for help because of their bondage rose up to God. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the sons of Israel, and God took notice of them. Notice the verbs that are spoken of God in those verses. The Israelites are in slavery. They cry out to God, and what does it say God does? It says that he noticed their cries. He heard their groanings. He remembered his covenant with Abraham. He saw the sons of Israel and he took notice of them. You see the action of God. Go to chapter 3. In verse 7, look at what he says to Moses. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to to their cry, for I am aware of their sufferings. In verse 8, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land. Notice all of the activity of this personal, timeless God. God is not unconcerned about his people. He isn't apathetic or indifferent. His personal nature makes him interested in the lives of his people. I am. I exist. That's what God says his name is. I exist. Now, there are some things in the New Testament I want to call your attention to. First, let's go to Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. Paul says some things here that while he is not quoting from Exodus or any other scripture because he's preaching to a group of Gentiles, he uses some words that are very similar to what God said in Exodus 3. In Acts chapter 17, Paul says in verse 24, The God who made the world and all the things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Do you remember from Exodus 3, I said that God is self-sustaining. He is not dependent upon anyone or anything in order to exist. Isn't that what Paul says here? He is not served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now notice verse 28. For in him we live and move and exist. Your translation might say, have our being. The idea is the same. Why do we even exist? Because I am. Because God says, I exist. You are here. Because I am here. So in verse 28, in him we live, we move, and exist. We have life. We are active. We move. We are able to get up in the morning and go to work and work with our hands or work with our minds. We come back. We eat dinner. We do all of these things, whereas we function in life. God made that possible. We are active, just as we said God is active. He saw the groanings of the Israelites, and he heard their tears, and he came down to rescue them. 
God is active. We are active. God is life. We have life. God exists. So do we. Now go to John chapter 8. Let's talk about Jesus. And let's look at some things that he said about the name of God. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having a dialogue with the Jewish leaders. And he's talking about his unity and his oneness with the Father. In John 8 and verse 37, Jesus says to them, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. You you are physically the children of Abraham. You are his descendants. And yet, you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you have heard from your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. You see, Jesus is pointing out to them in this discussion that, yes, you are physically descending from Abraham. But there is a difference between being a physical descendant of Abraham and being someone who has the character and the faith of Abraham. And so Jesus will call them out in this discussion for not being children of Abraham in the sense of having the character and the faith of Abraham. Your lineage is not all that important, he will tell them. Your character and your faith are what matters. Now, as Jesus has this discussion with them, he he really brings it to a head in verse 44. When he says, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Abraham's not your father. Not not with the way you're living, not with the faith and the character that that you have. The devil is your father. And of course, that is going to make them angry. But as you continue reading, if you look at verse 51... Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. And the Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. Abraham died and the prophets also. And you say, if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste of death. Who do you think you are, Jesus? If we listen to your words, we'll never die. Our father Abraham is dead. The prophets of old are dead. Are are you saying that you're greater than them? That's their question. Are you saying you're greater than Abraham? Verse 53. Surely you are not greater than our father Abraham who died. The prophets died too. So whom do you make yourself out to be? Notice that question. Who are you? What did Moses ask in Exodus 3? Suppose the Israelites ask, who sent you? What is his name? What will I tell them? Verse 56, Jesus says in response, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? (laughs) You're saying some absurd things, Jesus. Abraham saw you. You saw Abraham. You're not even 50 years old. He wasn't even 40 years old. How how can you say these things? Now, here's the climax in verse 58. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I 
am. You see that connection to Exodus 3? Before Abraham was even born, I exist. I was, I am, I will be. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus reaches back to Exodus 3 and he takes hold of the very name of God and he applies it to himself. And the Jews that he was talking to didn't miss the significance of this. Look at verse 58. Therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. They made the connection. They understood exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus is claiming deity here. He is claiming the name of God. And the Jews said, this is blasphemy of the worst kind. And they sought to kill him. What is God's name? I was, I am, I will be. Go to Revelation. Let me show you this connection. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. Revelation 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. That's talking about the Father. He was, he is, he is to come. You see that? Past, present, future. Now look at verse 8. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Past, present, future. Jesus is God. One more. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Past, present, future. What's God's name? I exist. Well, God, when do you exist? Always. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Well, Jesus, who are you? I exist. I am. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Both the words of Jesus in John 8, John 10, and other places, and the words of New Testament writers confirm the conviction that Jesus is God. When we meet someone, the first thing we ask them is their name. And we do that because that understanding is hopefully the beginning of a future, deeper association. Now, as we often do this time of year, we start thinking about the new year. We start thinking about changes we'd like to make and things that we hope to do better in the new year. And usually, all of us will plan to grow spiritually deeper and stronger in the new year. I've had two conversations in the past week that I think highlight something that we need to be thinking about and, and emphasizing. In these two conversations, the exact same things were said. 
I think one of our greatest weaknesses, both within the church and certainly people outside the church, is that we don't know God as we should. We are weak in the Old Testament. We have forgotten the stories of the Old Testament that teach us about the character of God. The stories that teach us about the goodness and the mercy of God, but also the stories that teach us about the judgment and the wrath of God. And I think a great place for us to begin understanding God better is by first knowing his name. I exist. Yesterday, today, and forever. The existing one, the great I am, Yahweh, Yahovah, I don't care how you pronounce it, we're all probably wrong anyways. This lesson was one of the more challenging subjects for me that I've researched uh, in in a while. If you want to talk some more, if you have questions, I'm happy to talk and point you in the direction of some things that maybe you could read that might be helpful. But I appreciate your attention this morning, and I hope the lesson has been helpful to you. There may be someone here this morning who needs to obey the gospel of Christ, and you're ready to do that. We want to help you as we move closer to a new year. We we want you to begin a new life in Christ, and we want you to do that today. If we can help you in some way, we welcome you to please come right now as we stand and sing together.